We've been talking a little bit about um, exhortation and uh, the importance of it. And uh, I realize it kind of flies in the face of, um, I hate to say it, modern or even Bible-believing theology. Uh, I, I say this in the form of a compliment. Most of you uh, don't have a problem with being uh, egotistical. Are you listening to me? Most of you don't have a problem with being egotistical. Most of you don't have a problem with being conceited. Uh, unfortunately, hey chief, unfortunately, uh, oftentimes preaching is done because of one or two individuals that don't fit the mold. Uh, for instance, you'll get a lot of good messages on people that don't come to church, but what about all the people that are gathered in the church? Or you'll get a message about some of the hoodlums that are in the church, but what about the ones that are not hoodlums? Well, unfortunately, um, because the world in and of itself is somewhat egotistical and somewhat conceited and has a tendency to put uh, too much confidence in the flesh and in the intellectualism of mankind, uh, the tendency sometimes out of the pulpit is, is that we're going to fix everything by addressing those social malfunctions from the pulpit as if everyone is guilty of the same thing that the rest of the world is guilty of. Uh, I, I don't say this to my peers or to make any statement toward them, but that comes from watching too much news and not enough Bible. Because you have to take people that God's called you to minister to where they are, not where the world is. I don't judge you based upon the world. The world's not in church this morning. The world's not listening to church this morning. The world's not interested in church this morning. The world doesn't listen to the Bible. The world doesn't play the Bible on their stuff and they don't struggle with sin. They do whatever it is they want to do. Now, one of the greatest sins that we as Bible believers commit is, and this is going to sound like an oxymoron to some of you, and it's going to sound like I've gone apostate and I've, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gone uh, crazy, I'm non-doctrinal. You're too hard on yourself. You have a tendency to beat yourself up. You have a tendency to almost lift up, to, to uh, venerate, to exalt your failures. Uh, you think it's spiritual to talk, you know, I'm lower and well poop in the bottom of the ocean, you know. I'm so low I can crawl out under the threshold of the door. I'm, you know, I'm just no good and I'm just rotten because you've been taught for a long time that that's spiritual, that debasing yourself means you must be spiritual. I'm for you accepting responsibility for your failures, but to concentrate on nothing but your failures turns you into your failures. I'll say that again. To concentrate on nothing but your failures turns you into your failures. Nobody teaches that in any school or college. Nobody teaches that in any, if you want even to go to a self-help program. They don't teach that you focus on the things that you do wrong. Now, let me be careful how I say what I'm about to say because I realize that there are many, many people that have gotten a lot of help from um, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and those kind of things. But one of the pitfalls of those programs is... Every time you meet with other people, you're doing two things that can be horribly detrimental to your getting better. Number one, you're meeting with people who have the same problem you have. Birds of a feather flock together. But when one bird moves, generally the rest of the birds tend to follow. The second thing is, is you're being reminded of your addiction or the, the products that have an addiction to you and you have to stand up and associate yourself with that addiction. Hi, my name is David. I'm an alcoholic. Okay, now I've been, I'm not an alcoholic anymore. <laughs> that was the timing, wasn't it? <laughs> You never knew that when you married me. <laughs> hey, for better, for worse, babe, just saying. <laughs> you vowed that before God, so. <laughs> so. So here's what happens. Here's what happens. You associate with, I'm never going to be any better than an alcoholic. Do you understand? No, I, I used to be addicted to alcohol. I'm saved. I don't have that habit anymore. I'm trying to improve. Are you with me so far? Yes, to constantly say that never allows you to rise above 
whatever it was you were addicted to. And you can put in anything there. It can be alcohol, it can be food, it can be, uh, it can be uh, narcotic, uh, narcotics, it can be drugs, it can be anything you want to put in there. But here's the thing you have to recognize. To constantly do that seems to keep you in this facade that as long as I'm putting myself down, I'm spiritual. No, the Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. That means that we would tend to think that someone who was pharisaical is better than somebody who is <laughs> ultra-liberal and doing everything and anything. But the Lord said they're both out of balance. You find more verses in the Bible where the Lord Himself, during His walk here and during His ministry of three and a half years, addressing Pharisees than you have Him addressing robbers and, and prostitutes and other people like that. He helped the sick people but he didn't spend as much time preaching at them about their sin as he did the sins of the Pharisees. So one of the things that I want to try to make sure that you understand to try to change your mind, come to second, I'll come back to 2 Timothy in a minute, come back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Now I want to ask you a couple of questions and although they are somewhat rhetorical, I'd like for you to consider answering the question. If you're saved, were you or were you not born again? So what you were ceased to be in the sense of your soul. Is that correct? All right. Now, if you've been born again, is it a fair statement to say this? You have a new father. Do you inherit the attributes of your old father if you have a new father? See where you hesitated? Well, well, yeah, yeah, you see your schizo. So now, watch this. The, the, the attributes you inherit are the ones you embrace depending upon which father you choose to follow. You have now the power to overcome even the wrong upbringing or even I didn't have a father in the sense of, of somebody to take, a, a daddy, somebody to take care of me. I, I know you had to have a father to be born. Don't get all uh, specific with me in particular. But now what I'm talking about is somebody to raise you. Well, I wasn't, I didn't have a good father. I didn't have a good mother and I wasn't raised. I was orphaned and I wasn't all this and that and the other. Okay, you just did the same thing that the alcoholic does at Alcoholics Anonymous. I cannot excel above... I'm an orphan child and I'm no good and I'm rotten and I'm terrible and I didn't get the breaks everybody else got. I was born in a black skin instead of a white skin. I was born with blonde hair instead of brown hair. I was born with curly hair instead of straight hair. I was born with gray eyes instead of blue eyes. I was born a female instead of being born a male. Now do you understand or are you beginning to get the picture where there's this misconception of well I, I, I know I was born in a man's body but I've got a woman inside me or I know I'm a woman but I feel more like a man. You're following the wrong father. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 So that's why I know for a fact that if you're doing those things, it means that you're following an earthly father with earthly attributes, following after the flesh and not following after the spirit. The spirit means I got to do what God says. It doesn't matter if the world, but my other father, the old father, the Bible says of the Lord in John chapter number uh, six, he says, uh, uh, eight, John chapter number eight, he says to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Well, they weren't born of the father of the devil, but because they have an earthly upbringing and they haven't got a new father, he attributes that to mean you're going to do the things, what? The works of him you will do. So here's what I have to, have to get you to understand. If you don't change your mind, you'll never rise above whatever your greatest malady is or your besetting sin is. Anybody, now this is rhetorical and I don't want an outside or outlier or hand show and say, anybody in here ever mess up? You ever sinned since you've been saved? How many of you allow that sin to now identify you as a person that you're that person? You'll never rise above, well, I was a drug addict. Well, I did this. Well, I did that. And the list is about 900 miles long. But you've been born again. You have a chance to change. Amen. To constantly focus on your failures will turn you into your failures because you will become what you think on. As a man thinketh in his heart, 
Now, let me ask you a question. Let me make you an illustration. Uh, let's say that you struggle with alcohol. If every time you go to get help with your alcohol addiction, you're talking about and thinking about alcohol, how long do you think it will be before you turn to alcohol when things get bad? So the Lord said, whatsoever things are right, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good, and, and so on and so forth in Philippians 4. He says, think on these things. Why does He tell you that? He tells you that because He recognizes that in all of us, in, innate in us as nature, as human beings, what we think on is what we become. Now they try to tap into this to say, think yourself a millionaire and you'll be one. Not if you don't work and not if you don't save money. You'll never be one. Some of you, you know, you just live off of the government, live off of whatever else it might be and, and those kind of things. Well, I'm just no good. I don't have the intellect and all that. If you've got ability to have a work ethic, you can make it. If you've got a work ethic. You don't have to have brains. Do you know I know men in this church that are contractors and stuff like that that would pay top dollar just to have somebody that show up at work every day and be honest. That's a commodity nowadays. You can't, you can't find somebody. You mean you'll come to work? Yeah, I'll be here every day 15 minutes early. I'll, I'll work long and I'll stay late and that kind of a thing. Man, I'll pay you 20 bucks an hour. You say, why? Just because you show up. And just because you say you're going to be where you're going to be and you're there instead of the smoke and mirrors. Now, what I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to help you because you have to make the choice. I'm, I'm trying to brainwash you. And I'm trying to brainwash you by telling you you have been brainwashed. Let me give you an illustration. Right now, the media is brainwashing you to, to herd you in a certain direction about certain things. Some of you have gotten to the point that you believe the media more than you believe the Bible. I got two amens on that. And everybody, goes, well, you know, preacher, you're just not informed and all that kind of stuff. Okay. You believe in the media. It wouldn't stand up in any court because a lot of the stuff they're saying, they have no proof for it all. They're just talking. Yep. Right. Right. Now you do what you need to do. I'm not talking about don't protect yourself or anything like that. But I'm trying to tell you that the thing that started with Goebbels that I gave you not long ago, and I explained all that stuff to you, did not start by them hurting up Jews and throwing them in the oven. It started by changing the people's minds about how they felt about a race of people. Amen. Then when they started hurting up the mentally deficient and the physically deformed and disabled and the people that were not like them, nobody said anything because it's like, oh, well, it, they're, they're not really people anyway. They're not even human beings. They're, they're, just, they're, just, they're, they're not even really animals. They're not like a deer or a dog or a cat. They're rats. That's what they were called, vermin. That, that's what they were called. That propaganda went on for a long period of time before they started herding them up and putting them in ovens. Now think about this. They were able to herd up somewhere in the neighborhood in Russia and in Germany over 15 million people and there was no uprising. They were loading up trucks and shooting men, women, and children in the streets. And there was no uprising. They killed a million people in Rwanda. In 30 days, a million people. Because a guy had been on the radio and had been broadcasting for nearly six months. And when the Hutus and the Tutsis got into it, they had convinced the people that this one tribe was not even human. And there was no uprising. If you believe something and hear it repeated enough times, if the Bible is right, God forbid I bring that in, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Stop building a nest to fall into. Well, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm just no good anyway. And if I do manage to make it, it is just understand that, no, you're building a nest for your failure because you're planning on being a failure. You have to change how you think. That doesn't mean you walk around thinking you're all that in a bag of chips, but you've got to change your mind to think that always putting yourself down makes you spiritual. You say, well, the Apostle Paul said, the Apostle Paul in 13 epistles said a couple of times 
O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There's a difference in humility and being honest about your struggle in the flesh and the spirit and going around with a mindset of I'm rotten, I'm terrible, I'm no good, I'm never good enough. Nobody's ever good enough. Thank God for the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for that, listen, you don't amount to anything until you meet Him. But know this, once you meet Him, the potential you have in reference to eternity is far and beyond anything that anybody could imagine that they could do as a leader of an entire nation because you have a new father. Now, do you understand why it's important to read the Bible? Because you have to change how you think. Are you in 2 Corinthians? Look into verse number chapter 10. Come down, if you will, please, and just make it um, do uh, verse number... Two, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Well, there it is right off of Jump Street. Oh, Paul's just in the flesh. He's just, he just talking about the flesh. You're not just Paul. He's in the flesh. That's what they say about every preacher that gets wound up or jacked up. Are not all these drunk with new wine? I mean, something's wrong with them. Why are they so excited about that? That's just Paul. He's in the flesh. It can't be spiritual because it runs contrary to mainstream thought. Well, as the guy would say, duh. It is supposed to run contrary to mainstream thought. It's God's thought. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are high above our thoughts. It should be contradictory to mainstream thinking. They want to change your thinking and make you conform like a little sheep going to a slaughter to what they want you to think, but not be an independent thinker. The Bible makes you an independent thinker. You be what God tells you to be. And then guess what? You don't have to be what they're trying to tell you you are. Oh, well, you can only be this because you went to this school or you didn't go to that school. You know, oftentimes people equate intellectualism by who they associate with. Just because you hang out with smart people don't make you smart. But some people think because you follow after somebody that went to Yale or they went to Harvard or they went to Midwestern or, or they went to some school that has some Stanford or whatever, some, that, that all of a sudden because you're hanging out with people that went to that school that you just by osmosis obtained their intellect and it makes you so smart that you're in that crowd. It didn't change your intellect. It didn't bump your IQ up any more than putting on glasses made you any smarter. You might look a little smarter because you have glasses on. You say, why? You associate people that wear glasses with bookworms. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. And then when you get old and have to wear glasses, you're thinking, I wish I didn't have to wear glasses, you know. But, well, just think of yourself as being smarter. And the way that you can do that or accomplish that is don't open your mouth. <laughs> just wear the glasses and let people go. <laughs> You say, where's that in the Bible? Proverbs, even a fool's considered wise when he keeps his mouth shut. Yes, yes. <laughs> See, I got on glasses. Must be pretty smart. <laughs> the second you open your mouth, like, man, them glasses will fool you every time. <laughs> are you starting to understand the concept? Yes, sir. Some of you are way too hard on yourself. Depression, not in this nation, not in this world, not in this county, and not in this country. Depression in the church is at exponential rates right now because people have been taught for years that it's spiritual to beat yourself up. Listen, there's nobody in a Bible-believing church that'll get put in their place any faster than somebody that walks around as a conceited donkey and always acting like they got everything all together. They get put in their place pretty quick. But all of you are kind of treated like if I'm doing the opposite, I'm, I'm okay. Well, I hate to hear you, but I, I hate being around people that are always down on themselves. You say, why? I kind of feel like they're fixing to take me down with them. And here's what you'll do. You'll have a tendency, if somebody tells you something bad about themselves, you'll want to up them by something bad about you to make them feel better about feeling bad about themselves. And then the next thing you know, in order for you to relate to them, see, preacher, this just sounds psychological. It ain't psychological, it's common sense. 
In order for you to relate to them, you know what you'll start doing? You'll take on their beliefs and then you know what you'll start doing? You'll start putting yourself down so that you can reach that same common denominator. Oh, we're on the same page now. We're on the same plane now. And what did you compromise to be able to get there? You know what the Apostle Paul does? The Apostle Paul gives you a great contrast. I'll come to 2 Corinthians in a second. The Apostle Paul gives you a great contrast. They come in there and they try to remind Paul of his past. When he's up there in front of Felix and Agrippa, he's up there in front of what you would call the Supreme Court of the United States. He's up there in the Supreme Court of all the nation of Israel. And he has a chance to present his case. And he comes out there and he's in chains. And they say, Paul, you can speak for yourself. And what do you think? And he said, I think myself happy. And they said, well, you stand accused of murder. And you stand accused of, of making order orphans out of children and widows out of women and you stand accused of improperly using the law for your benefit and you stand accused of this and that and the other and Paul said uh, I'm guilty of everything you said but I'm not that person anymore right. he doesn't go yeah you know what I've never gotten over that mistake I, 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 I've never gotten over that sin and uh, you know God was good to me to even bother to save me I, I was so low and all that the Lord knocked me down in the dirt to get my attention and I just let me and Paul doesn't spend all of his time talking about what he used to be because he's trying to show you a principle. I am not what I used to be. That doesn't mean I don't recognize who I used to be. It means I'm not going to dwell on that because he says, I press toward the mark and the high calling of God. I'm looking at the author and finisher of my faith. I can't look there and look there at the same time. If I'm going to plow a straight line, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back can plow a straight line. You have got to stop being so hard on yourself. Because you've been taught improperly that that's spiritual. And then we get into this spiritual test the same way the Pharisees got into it by having broader uh, uh, borders in their garments and bigger phylacteries and bigger uh, things to wipe around their, <coughs> pardon me, their hand and to get more show and more attention to wear more garments and to look at all the things that they had done and they had accomplished. But we do the same thing. You know, well, I did this. Oh, well, I did that, but I also did this. Well, you know, I know you did this and you did that, but boy, I did this, that, and this. And the next thing you know, your spiritual competition begins to rise to the surface because I'm more spiritual than they are because I've been through more trash and dirt and more failures than they have. I'm a bigger trophy of God's grace because of my wicked, ungodly past. So they get in the pulpit and what do they do? It's like going to a movie and watching an X-rated movie because they get up and they start talking about all of the sordid things they did in their past. And corrupting your mind to make you think that if you didn't do those, God didn't really do something for you. Pardon me, I'm getting a little wound up. I realize it's just Sunday school, but it's something that you need to grab a hold of. You say, why? One of the greatest sins in the church today is the sin of self-abasement. I'm not talking about responding to conviction. I'm not talking about not confessing what I did wrong. If you look in your Bible, I think you'll find this in 1 John chapter number 1. He makes it very apparent that if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, the truth's not in you. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship the one with another. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If I'm clean, why do I have to jump back in the pig pen? Somebody wants to remind me of it? Sorry. I wish I had had a better testimony. I'm trying to overcome that. Appreciate it if you wouldn't remind me of what I used to be. Amen. I'm trying not to be that. But if I think about that, I'm going to do it. Remember me giving you the illustration? If you look down, you go down. Where you look at is where you go. Well, if you're constantly looking at your failures, guess what's going to happen? Sooner or later, you're going to convince yourself that that's who you are. You're no better than your failures. And then guess what happens to you? It is like circling the drain. It's like a swirly. Do you all even know that back in the day? Back in the day, they had a way of getting somebody's attention and they would hold their head in the toilet and flush the toilet. It's called a swirly. 
I'm not advocating you do that. But some of you do that yourself. You put your head in the toilet of your own failure and you just keep flushing it like it's going to get better. Well, keep flushing it, but I hate to tell you this, the stench is still there. Well, I'm just being a realist. You're being an idiot. You will never get any better until you... Not Look, I'm not talking about I'm, I'm seeing myself as a multi-billionaire and therefore I am. Then go join Melaleuca or Amway. Go get into some, you know, uh, get into some kind of a, a program that will allow you to, to build on other people's foolishness. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, Lord, what would you have me to be? It's a strange thing. The Lord doesn't spend all his time reminding David of his failures. Did you ever notice that? Do you see the Lord after he called Moses out to say, you know, Moses, you remember, don't forget, I was there 40 years with you on the backside of the desert. You know, after you killed a man, buried him, put him in the sand, and then you ran from him, Moses. Just let me remind you of that. You say, what is that? <laughs> That's this time of year. Let me remind you of everything I've done for you, and I've always been there for your failures. Is that all you see God as? God said he puts it as far as the east is from the west. Am I in the Bible? Yes. He said he puts it behind his back. He said he remembers it no more. He said he puts it in the depths of the sea. How come I have to remind him of it all the time? If he forgave me, why can't I forgive myself? If he forgave me, why can't I move on? I understand there can be repercussions. I, under, I get that. I know that if I do wrong, I deserve to pay for that. Paul makes that extremely clear. But ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to help you with is for the majority of you, is this mindset, this concept that I have to, in order to be spiritual, I have to blow up and enhance my failures. Well, let's see if we can change the switch today. Let's see if, as a friend of mine told me recently, you got it wired backwards. You got the common where the hot ought to be and the hot where the common ought to be. Okay, let's just see if we do. You say, why? Wow, the switch don't work. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if we can put the wires in the right spot and let's see if we can get the right balance. Yes. How about if we say, yeah, but by the grace of God, there go I and thank God for it and I'm doing the best I can. Right. Well, are you perfect? Nope. But I'm trying to be like Christ. Yes. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he gives you the idea. Now, I realize it's going to take me saying this about a bajillion times for me to be able to overcome and to rewire your thought process that you have been taught, many of you for years, that it is spiritual to constantly be putting yourself down. It's not spiritual at all. It's demonic. The devil is the one that reminds you of your failures, not God. God reminds you of your goodness, of his goodness. And what he's done for you. He said, well, preacher, what happens if I've messed up and stuff? The Lord will, every time you get ready to step back into that besetting sin, he may hit the play button and let you see you want to go down that road again. You want to go back where you were before. Some of you have a time of it, don't you? Some of you that you try to keep other people under control. All you can remember that they did was the stuff they did wrong, isn't it? You don't let them get away with anything they do right. As soon as they do wrong. See? See, do they ever get another chance? Biggin down here shaking his head. The rest of y'all look like you got lockjaw. You say, what is that? You're a control freak. You're trying to control people. You must think a little of yourself. A little of yourself. That's why you're so hard on other people. That's why you're always enhancing their failures. That's why you won't let them off the mat. Because you think it enhances you because you've never done what they did. And it justifies your feeling the way toward them. Some of you are way too suspicious of other people. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. You are not going to like this. Because you think those people are pulling over on you what you're pulling over on other people. That's why some of you have like a tenth sense where you've got radar. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about them. You see yourself in them? You see yourself in them? You think they're pulling some? It's easy to see the sins in others you're guilty of committing yourself. You have somebody around you that's all the time enhancing the things you've done wrong. You know what you should do? You say, hit them in the head. No. <laughs> Get away from them. 
If somebody wants to exhort you and encourage you, here's the Bible-believing way. I, I got to get to this in a minute. But this is important. Somebody comes up to you and says, you did a good job. Well, uh, glory be to God and, and thank God for that. And, you know, God's the one that gave me the talent. And if, and if it wasn't for God doing that, I will never tell you you did a good job ever again. Because all you're doing is, is cranking the spotlight more and more and more and, and all that kind of stuff. Because you know what you can do? You can say thank you. Don't sequester them from encouraging you. And don't sequester somebody that's trying to encourage somebody besides you. Right. Amen. Boy, the preacher, he preached a good message. Don't tell him that. He'll get puffed up. You ever have somebody come up to you and say, you get done preaching, they come up to you and they say, now I'm not trying to puff you up. <laughs> but I got a blessing out of that. <laughs> That's like you hit a home run. Not trying to puff you up. But you sure did hit that one right over the center field fence. That was a, oh, you mean it's different in sports than it is in spiritual things. It's different when somebody closes the business deal. It's different when somebody makes a good deal and drives a nail straight or whatever it might be and somebody comes in and they're a blessing because these kids get up and quote some scripture and you tell them good and you're like, don't, don't, go, don't go overboard with that. The world's going to encourage them. You say, what is encouragement? It's exhortation. It's you did good. You know what you ought to do today? Right now inside you ought to say, I did good. I'm sitting here listening to this. <laughs> You did good. You came to church. You didn't know what's an odd thing. People say you don't have any faith today. You never know what God's going to put across the plate. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. You never have any way of knowing what God's going to throw at you. If the preacher is supposed to be hooked up with the Lord, he may have an outline up there and the Lord say, we're going to get away from that for just a little while this morning. Mm -hmm. And then somebody's sitting here going, I didn't plan on getting that. I want you to listen to me. You're not known by your failures. God can forgive you for anything. Amen. 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 And you need to stop trying to pay for what is paid for. God forgave you. You know, when somebody says something to you, just say, I'm a charity case. I'm just a charity case. That's all I am. You mean he forgave? Yep. That old uh, uh, prostitute comes to him at the well. She's been with six different men that are not her husband. They're somebody else's husband. And she goes back in and she slaps their mouth shut because all they would say to her would be about her past. You know what the Bible says? She told him, he told me everything I ever did. So he knows everything I did, but he gave me a drink anyway. So guess what happens? They're like, maybe I need to go see him. You say, why? You all got stuff in the closet. I'm preaching right now, or I, I guess I should make it more amicable and say, we all have stuff in the closet. Well, who don't know that? You've heard me preach here for over 30 years. You know I got stuff in the closet, but it ain't that. Let me just clarify. I'm just, you know... Amen. Yeah. <laughs> but if all you do is focus on the past, two things are going to occur. Number one, if you do move ahead, the path is going to be crooked. But more likely than not, if all you do is look at the past, you probably aren't going to move anywhere in the present. You shouldn't be known by yourself for nothing but your failures. Yep. Yep. That's a big ask, isn't it? It's a struggle, isn't it? Because it's the reason I can't move forward. Because look what I did in my past. I don't deserve... To move forward. Oh, okay. You're paying for what's paid for. If the Lord wanted to exact punishment and or payment, could He do that? Absolutely. Yes. 
So now it begs the question, well, if he didn't take that payment from you, but he paid it, why are you trying to pay for what's been paid? Because it makes us a part of the yea hath God said society. We're looking at the tree. I know the Lord said he'd forgive me, but I think that applies to all those people, but it can't apply to me. No, the Lord said, I forgive you. And if he forgave you and he forgot it, why do you insist on constantly reminding him of it? Number two, why do you insist on constantly telling other people not just, hey, the Lord's been good to me, but let me give you all the details of how good He's been to me. You know what that lets me know about you right off the bat? You're in a time capsule. You are locked into your past. Therefore, you are doomed to repeat your past. And can I say this to some of you who think you're in the upper echelon, when you hold somebody to their past, you're trying to control what God could do with them in their future. It's up to God what God does and who He uses. I'm going to preach to you this morning about some shabby shepherds. Because God, of all the people He could appear to, He appeared to the social, on the social ladder to the people on the lowest end of the social ladder. Just a bunch of stinking shepherds, tending sheep. And of all the people he could have appeared to and had a choir of angels, just nobodies, nothings, nothing. But how the world sees nothing and how God sees nothing are two different things. Preacher, I'm, I'm just nothing until he made you something. Is this making any sense to you? Yes, sir. We're actually going to... We're not going to get to this. <laughs> we're fixing to take a break. Here's what I need for you to understand. You're going to have to change your mind, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because the line of thinking that you have fallen into is a non-biblical way of thinking. And not only does it affect you, and I'll be done with this right here, it also affects how you see others. Because you see other people from the platform from whence you stand. Somebody says something to you, but it goes through an interpretation process. You interpret what they're saying based upon where you're standing. And therefore, when they said something... They meant something different, but you heard it based upon where you're at, where you're standing. And if you're always seeing yourself as the mistakes you made when you were 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 18 and 20 and 25 and 30 and all that, what you hear comes in and says, yeah, but that, that doesn't fit me because I'm, I'm an exception to the rule. I, I messed up worse. I've been divorced. I've had uh, uh, done things I shouldn't have done. I'm an exception to the rule. So then when you hear the goodness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the long suffering of God, it's like, well, that's for everybody. That's not for me. I don't deserve that. You're trying to pay for something. It's already paid for. In common layman terms, your money ain't no good but it will make you spiritually demented and mentally sick because you will then fall into the habit or the trap of judging everybody from where you are because you will not forgive yourself. You will always be in the habit because you're living in your past of reminding everybody of their past to try to create some value for yourself. Do you realize what I have to do to be able to put up with you? I mean, 
you were so low on the totem pole and I came in like Jesus on a white horse and I rescued you and I, I took care of you because I'm really so wonderful. No, what you're really saying is, is I'm no good. I'm trying to get value out of what I did for you that is of no value. Listen, if you've helped anybody at all, it's because God has helped you. Amen. 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 It's not because you're Mr. or Miss Charitable. As a matter of fact, we have in attendance today Ebenezer Scrooge. Using the Christmas metaphor. Because most of us have lived our life, including our thought process, for what's best for us. We're not as much like Christ as we think. We employ the ideas of Jesus Christ when it works to lift ourselves up, make us look like what we did for the missionaries and what we did for the preachers and what we did for the charitable organizations and what we did to see people saved and all that's kind of like, yeah, let me, let me help you out. But don't forget, I had to stoop way down there to get you. So you should be eternally grateful that I was willing to come down so low to help somebody like you. That's called patronizing somebody. So if you don't get anything else out of this day, you have got to change the thought in your mind that it is spiritual to debase yourself, constantly putting yourself down and learned at this time of the year above all to be charitable and accept the charity that He gave you when He said, your sins have been forgiven. And embrace it. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean repeat it. It doesn't mean go back out and take it for granted and do it. It means I got to change, but I got to change by not thinking about the alcohol. Preacher, you know, I've always struggled with alcohol. Well, quit thinking about it. Well, preacher, I just have a hard time. You know, I just, I walk by the store and I see it and I just think about it. And I just think, you keep thinking about it. Yeah. You look down, you're going to go down. Can I make it a little more personal? When you learn to make other people's lives your business, you become an alcoholic who gets drunk on other people's social life. And you just can't resist being involved like an alcoholic can't quit messing with alcohol. You can't quit messing with other people's personal lives. You're addicted. But the problem is not the failure in other people's lives. The reason you magnify that is because of how you view yourself. And the truth is, is you're putting on a mask and pointing to all of their stuff so that nobody will look too close at your stuff. Instead of saying, I got too many other things to worry about. I don't have time to be worried about what everybody else is or isn't doing. You get value out of knowing what everybody else is doing. They're not the problem. That's not the mind of Christ. The problem is, is the reason you can't overcome it is because when you stand up, you don't say you're an alcoholic. God forbid. I mean, maybe a little on Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving, Mother's Day, call for a cold <laughs> on occasion at the restaurant when it's good for your business deal. Anyway, you wouldn't say I'm an alcoholic. You wouldn't say I'm a drug addict. You don't just stand up and say, Hi, my name's David. I'm a gossip. You're addicted. And that's why you keep repeating the same thing because that's all you think about. And you hear preaching on it. You get under conviction about it. But you can't let it go. Now you justify. So guess what happens? Before long, you're seated in a table of 20 people in a burned out sanctuary or in a warehouse. And the 20 chairs are there. And the donuts and the coffee are there, the sugar and the caffeine, and you're standing up. Hi, 
My name's David. Hi, David. I'm an alcoholic. Guess who's in the circle? Alcoholics. And before long, if you look around, guess what you find out? The people that have your attributes are in your circle. Want to change? Change your company, but change your mind. Amen. Father, I pray you'll bless the Sunday school hour this morning. You might help us to make some of these changes and pray you'll be with us in the upcoming hour. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.